Dr. Dennis Murphy, Western Washington University class of 1969 and 1970, and Dean Emeritus from the College of Business and Economics, is your commencement speaker. Dr. Murphy, one of Western's longest serving administrators, is best known for his 25 years as Dean of Western's College of Business and Economics, but his ties to Western go much deeper than that. Dr. Murphy earned a bachelor's degree in economics at Western and a master's degree in economics the following year. After completing a doctorate at Indiana and serving as a faculty member there and at Emory in Atlanta, Dr. Murphy returned to Bellingham in 1979 and has been a part of Western ever since. He served as Dean of Western's College of Business and Economics from 1982 to 2007 and twice served as Western's Provost. He has retired from administrative work, at least for the current time, but Dr. Murphy continues to spend time in Parks Hall teaching the number of courses a year in economics and finance. Dr. Murphy's research interests include commercial banking and corporate governance, and he has put these skills to work in business and community affairs. He is a member of the Saturna Capital Board of Directors, Saturna's Council of Economic Advisors, and a board member of St. Paul's Academy. He is past chairman of the board of Cascade Financial and Cascade Bank, as well as past president of the United Way of Whatcom County and the Rotary Club of Bellingham. Please join me in welcoming a distinguished graduate and friend of Western, Dr. Dennis Murphy. Members of the Board of Trustees, President Shepard, members of the Platform Party, family and friends of the graduates, and to all of those who have made this day necessary, welcome. I would like to add my commendation and admiration to that of the University in honoring the history and contributions of the Lecoq family to this county on so many levels. The financial services industry is not an easy industry in which to succeed. But People's Bank has a long history as an exemplary part of our local business and civic culture. I first met Irwin and Francis in the early 80s when they invited me to their headquarters office for lunch. And Irwin drove me around Linden and pointed out the building where WWU had temporarily taught courses pending the development of this campus. It is especially nice to see their grandson, Ryan, here today. When children of prominent people, or of your acquaintances, enroll in one of your courses, you have two thoughts. How prescient to have picked Western. And secondly, I hope they're good students. <laughs> I am pleased to note that Ryan was a very good student indeed who went on from Western to LSE for a graduate degree, and his whole family should took pride in his accomplishments. A commencement speech is a particularly difficult assignment. The speaker is given no topic, but is in expected to inspire the graduates and the general audience with a stirring speech of substance, preferably laced with humor. As an academic, and an old one, I should be good at it. An old academic is like an old shoe. Everything is worn out except the tongue. <laughs> we are now given a sort of time limit. Seven minutes, I am told, that I should be done within at least an order of magnitude of that limit. In a few minutes, the president will begin the conferring of the degrees. If he chooses to use the standard formulation, he will say that he confers upon each of you your degree with all of the rights, duties, and privileges appertaining thereunto. Congratulations. And you will all cheer, and your friends and families will applaud, and someone will shout out, possibly a father, it's about time. <laughs> and this entire room will be filled with bonhomie and smiles and good wishes. Parents, this is one of those days when your kids will acknowledge you, unlike the times when they didn't want to walk beside you in the mall or sit with you in the theater. Ogden Nash was right when he wrote, 
Children aren't happy with nothing to ignore, and that's what parents were created for. <laughs> you will not, I wager, spend much time thinking about the implications of that formulation, rights, duties, privileges. And because you won't, I'm going to take a few minutes this morning to talk about it. Western's central conceit is that we encourage in our students the habits of critical thinking, and I shall rely on that this morning. Just before the onset of the Battle of Trafalgar, Nelson, understanding the significance of that pending conflict, wanted to send his fleet one last message. He asked that the message, England confides that every man will do his duty, be signaled to the fleet. This was accomplished by a series of flags that related to a code book. Each set of three flags referred to a word in that book. However, there was no word for confides, and it was suggested that the word expects be substituted because it was in the code book and would significantly reduce signal time, and thus the famous line, England expects that every man will do his duty, was sent. But confidence is somewhat different than expects, and that is why I chose the somewhat more archaic term, confides, for today's topic. Being an educated person makes you different. How different? Aristotle was asked to what degree educated men were superior to uneducated. As much, said he, as the living are to the dead. H.G. Wells opined, human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe. Pretty heady stuff. You get a sense of the responsibility of being part of the educated. I know I am supposed to tell you to be all you can be and to go off and improve the world. Please consider it said. But you go off into a world fraught with difficulties, where the fabric of society is being stretched to the point of rending by the cacophony all around us with no unifying theme. So let us consider duty for a few minutes and what it might mean in the context of your duty as an educated person, a member of only 1%. Yes, you are a member of the 1% of the world population that has a university degree. Duty has, for years, been something of an uncomfortable concept, even subject to derision. How different from the days when Wordsworth penned his Ode to Duty. Ogden Nash, responding to Wordsworth's Ode to Duty, offered his own, a kind of Ode to Duty, which concludes, O oh, duty, duty, how noble a man should I be, hadst thou the visage of a sweetie or a cutie. A Czech fable, tells of St. Peter and Gabriel wandering the countryside in disguise, looking for lodging and being refused, until at last the poor but hospitable peasant company, compa, couple takes them in. St. Peter reveals himself and tells them that for their good deed, they can have anything they want. The husband begins, we have only miserable chickens, but our neighbor has a goat that yields milk every day. St. Peter anticipates, you mean that you want a goat too? No, we want you to kill the neighbor's goat. <laughs> Innovations are not welcome. When I was a boy, I was taught that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Not bad advice for a skinny Irish kid who might otherwise have perpetuated the stereotype of the Irish as fighters and brawlers. But today, words may well get you killed, so we need a more nuanced view. I am sure that you, as I was, were moved seeing the lines of Parisians holding signs saying, Je suis Charlie, in solidarity with the victims of the attack at the editorial offices of Charlie Hebdo, a French satirical newspaper. The incident is unfortunately all too common. Think Sony, for example but we do not have time to recite the complete list of attempts to silence. Free speech is so important that in the United States it is enshrined in the First Amendment to the Constitution, which means being prepared for speech we do not like, indeed abhor. It is particularly ironic that this attack happened in France, the birthplace of Voltaire, 
whom his biographer described as having the view that, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. An apologist for the attack managed to combine Orwell and Kafka into one comment when he said, why didn't the French government silence the publication and thereby protect the citizens from attack? Kill the goat. The pen may be mightier than the sword, but it takes more courage to wield. It takes an act of will to engage the duty of protecting freedom of thought and expression. The attackers were undoubtedly offended by the expression of the publication, scurrilous and blasphemous towards all religion, just as I at some time take offense at the expression of Robert Maplethorpe. However, the solution is not the imposition of silence, not killing the goat, but rather just the opposite. In his essay on liberty, John Stuart Mill said that we must allow for the expression of bad ideas, whether opinions or alleged statements of fact, because they may contain some grain of truth that corrects the conventional wisdom, or, lacking that, provide a challenge to accepted beliefs without which those beliefs in the long run become mere prejudice. Supreme Court Justice Brandeis advised in a 1927 opinion, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies, to avert the evil by the process of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. His view was seconded and even expanded two years later by jo Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' observation if there be any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. Know carefully his construction. It is the thought we hate rather than the feelings that motivate the speaker. The course of events is determined by ideas, and all too often by bad ideas, that are not countered by better ideas. Well, we are mindful of the ecclesiastical wisdom that there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. It is the duty of all educated women and men not to opt for silence out of fear or misplaced sensitivity. There is an ironic coda to this particular episode. Charlie Hebdo was on the verge of bankruptcy before the attacks forced even those who hate their speech to come to their defense. Hashtag Je suis Charlie indeed. The second duty that I suggest is perhaps a cousin of the first. We are living in an era when pejorative comments are the order of the day, when another's ideas and indeed they themselves are dispensed with by ad hominem attacks. A visit to the blogosphere provides ample examples. Left wing, right wing, Warmest denier, homophobe, racist, nut, doltish. Well, you get the picture. I choose as a particular example the use of the climate, of the phrase climate denier, although there is an embarrassment of riches in every field from which to choose. The term denier is, of course, more famous as the epithet for those that deny the irrefutable historical evidence of the Holocaust. The choice of this term to describe those who lack faith in computer models is an attempt to put skeptics on the same ethical and moral plane as those that deny the Holocaust. But the use of this term and all of the arsenal of pejorative and vituperative comments and ad hominem attacks directed at those who take a position or different view from our own have one thing in common. They are meant to reduce the other person's ideological position or argument speech to a caricature of disagreeable ideas that may then be dismissed out of hand. You do not have the appetite, I am sure, nor do I have the time for a lecture on Popperian epistemology versus Kuhnian paradigm theory, but I thought of it when I heard of Vice President Gore's comment this week, we need to punish climate change deniers. Silence them. Kill the goat. I invite you, 2015 graduates of Western Washington University, to take as a duty that you not join the courses of invective, 
but to be governed by what British jurist John Fletcher Moulton called obedience to the unenforceable. It is the realm in which virtues such as duty, fairness, judgment, and taste hold sway. I am confident that your critical thinking skills, and for that matter your vocabulary, are sufficiently honed that you will not take refuge in invective, but rather enter the arena of ideas prepared to engage seriously the challenges of our time. Let the goat live. I conclude with the words of none other than that eminent scholar, Dr. Seuss. The more you read, the more things you will know, the more things you learn, the more places you'll go. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know. You are the one who will decide where you go. Congratulations to you all. Western confides that you will do your duty. Thank you, Dennis.